praise if you can and join me in the call to worship. Once we were not a people. Now we are God's people. Once we ate food that did not satisfy. Now we drink the spiritual milk of our Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Please join us in prayer. Merciful God, our refuge and our strength, train our hearts on the words of your Son. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Feed our souls with your spiritual milk and build our very lives into spiritual houses that neither famine nor storm can shake the foundation of our faith. In the name of the Master Builder and Living Stone, we pray. Amen. to not 
believe something, then why should we worry?
Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 14. Hear now God's word. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Come. Come, Holy Spirit. Dwell in our hearts and our minds. Free us from the things that are distracting. And allow us to hear your word speak this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever really thought about doing any of the work that Jesus did while he was here on earth? And what about even greater works? How could that even be possible? You heard what we talked about with the kids. Could you feed 5,000 people? Could you walk on water? Could you raise the dead? Hmm. Those are pretty miraculous things. But Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. So whatever you ask in my name, I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. I don't know about you, but that sounds powerful to me. That sounds like assurance. Jesus' words are a bit perplexing, but they're also inspiring. And they encourage us. And they begin to make us think like Jesus. They're words of power. So what makes you excited? Maybe I should ask, what makes you grateful to God? Is it something simple? Maybe it's just waking up in the morning. Maybe it's something complex, like baby Hendrix, who surely did not have a good outcome from birth, but he's still alive, and he's still loved. Well, what about God's plan for Hyde Park, Bethlehem? 
Does God have a plan for his church? And does God have a plan for you and your life? I'd like to think that it all starts with a grateful attitude. And it all starts because we believe. In verses 12 through 14 in John 14, we see these words bear directly on our life, our life together in exciting times and days ahead. And what they say is that all of us who believe in Jesus will carry on his work. And in some wonderful way, something greater than the works of Jesus will be a means to an end. And we have access all through the prayers that we pray. So let's take a look at this text. It says, all of us who believe in Jesus will carry on his work. That's one thing. The second thing is, in some wonderful way, we will all do something greater, greater works of Jesus. And three, as a means to an end, we will have access to Jesus through prayer. And everything that we ask for, in the name of Jesus, we will receive. So let's examine how we can carry on the work of Jesus. Let's listen again to John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. There's two crucial observations there. First, his promise is not made to the apostles alone, but to everyone who believes. That's you and me, right? And second is a promise that we will do Jesus' work. It's not a promise that we will do greater works. It's Jesus' works. I would venture to say that most of us think we're normal Christians. And this is a promise to all of us, normal Christians. If you are a Christian, you are included in this statement. John is not talking about pastors or veteran Christians or highly spiritual or mature people or professional Christians or missionaries or evangelists or highly gifted Christians. No, the text says, whoever believes in me. Believers, pure and simple, will do the works that Jesus has done. We've seen this text before. Whoever believes in me, remember John 6.35, whoever believes in me shall not thirst. What about John 7.38? Whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. How about John 11.25? Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And John 12, 46, whoever believes in me will not remain in darkness. Whoever believes. In other words, this is what normal Christianity is. This is what it actually means to be a Christian. Believing Jesus is what unites him to eternal life. So when it says whoever believes in Jesus will do this or that, it's describing the normal Christian life. That's our first observation. It's the promise in verse 12. And it's not made to the apostles alone, but to all who believe. Here's the second observation. is that Jesus promises all believers will do his works. It's not yet a promise that we will do greater works, but Jesus' works. Verse 12a says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Now, we begin to create problems for ourselves immediately because we start thinking just like I explained to the kids about all those amazing miracles. But at this point in John's Gospel... Jesus has turned water into wine. He's read the mind of a woman of Samaria. He's healed an official son. He's healed a man crippled for 38 years. He's fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. 
He has walked on water. He has healed a man that was born blind. And he raised Lazarus from the dead after four days of being in the grave. So exactly what did Jesus mean when he said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Did Jesus mean that every Christian would do those kinds of things? Or that every Christian would do one or two of those works? And if you don't, does that mean that you don't believe? That is really not likely in view of the New Testament letters where miracles are mentioned. You see, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for a common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, faith by the same Spirit. And to others, gifts of healing by one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? If Jesus doesn't mean that all believers will do miracles like his, what does he mean when he says, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do? What does that mean? So if we look closely at the connections and then at a distant parallel, maybe we can make sense of this. What about works in believing? Let's just start there. If we looked at the connection between verse 11 and 12, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves, the word believe and the word works occur together in verse 11. Just like they come together in verse 12. Jesus' works are designed to help people believe, right? Believe on account of the works. In other words, if my verbal testimony is leaving doubts in your mind about who I am, take a look at what my works are doing. Let the works join with our words and let those things lead us to faith. That's what verse 11 is saying. Then verse 12 follows, and it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Now, if we put verse 11 and 12 together and let the function of the world in the same verses do what both say, verse 11 says, My works function to lead people to faith in me. And verse 12 says, When you believe in me, I will work in you like a vine works in a branch. Remember in John 15? And your works, like mine, will lead people to faith. Are you leading people to faith is what this is talking about, right? So the connection between 11 and 12 goes like this. Believe in me on account of my works. Let my works lead you to faith. Verse 11, because whoever believes in me, verse 12, will also do works that lead people to believe in me. So exactly what are those works that lead or point to Jesus? What specifically did Jesus have in mind that defines works that are pointers to him to help other people believe in him, to deepen our faith? Our words and actions must match. You can't say one thing and then turn around and do something else, right? Nobody believes that. When we witness to what Jesus is doing, we must follow with the words that Jesus has already given to us. That is what Jesus' works do. He is saying, at least, that is what all believers' works must do. Whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. Because, you see, we're to point people to faith in Jesus Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus, that's what your life is about. Your works, your life, are a display of your trustworthiness of Jesus. Do you trust Jesus? Do you trust Jesus? 
Here's another way to learn from this text. If we search for the exact phrase in verse 12a, the works that I do, it occurs one other place in John 10, 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. So again, the function of the word works in John 10, 25 is exactly the same as John 14, 11, and 12. My works are the things that bear witness about me. Hmm. We can say with confidence that in John 14, 11, and 12a, Jesus means that all believers are marked by this so that they will be united to Jesus and they will carry on his work by his power and do the things that bear witness and point towards Jesus. They will point people to Jesus and they will point people to the Father to glorify God. In his prayer in John 17, Jesus prayed, Father, I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. His work was what he did to draw attention to the glory of his Father. In John 13, 35, Jesus said, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. A life of love will draw attention to the truth of Christ and the reality of our own new life in him. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Christians are defined by works of life that flows from their faith in Jesus Christ and points to the glory of the Father. Many Christians have gifts, They have the gift of healing, or many other gifts that come from God. But all who believe, and that's what this text is about, all of them, all who believe will do the works of Jesus. And in that sense, all of his works testify to his truth and his deity. All of us profess to be Christians, Christ followers, And we are the aroma of Christ. Ruth said in our liturgy this morning, Taste and see that the Lord is good. God uses our senses, our humanness, to help us experience him fully. He says we are the light of the world. You know, Jesus told us we are not to be hidden under a basket. We were dead, and now we are alive, created in Christ Jesus for good works. God prepared those works beforehand, that we should walk in them. That's from Ephesians 2.10. A life of words and deeds should help people know and experience Jesus. That's the first part of our text. Whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. Now, what about those greater works? Greater works than Jesus? The second part of this text in John 14, 12b is that in some wonderful way, we will do something greater than the works of Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Again, it includes everyone, not just apostles, just not pastors or elders or charismatic evangelicals. Whoever believes greater works than these will he do. It's the mark of being a Christian, not an apostle. If you think that greater works means more miraculous, you're going to be hard-pressed to be able to walk on water, feed 5,000 people, raise the dead, I don't know any Christian who lived inside or outside of the New Testament who's ever done any of those miracles except Jesus. Remember, the New Testament tells us not to expect all Christians to have all gifts, to do all 
work of miracles. Do all possess the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? The answer Paul expects is no. Which means that when Jesus said, whoever believes in me greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father, he probably didn't mean that every Christian was expected to do more things that were miraculous than Jesus. So let's make some points of clarity. The New Testament letters were miracles. They were gifts that some Christians had and others did not. For example, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, to, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So we all have the Spirit. We are all given access to the Holy Spirit. It says, to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another with working of miracles. Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? This is 1 Corinthians 12. If Jesus doesn't mean that all believers will do miracles like his, what exactly does he mean then? Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. So what are the works that help you and I and others to believe? The words in verses 11 and 12 say, believe me. Believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. The words believe and works occur together. Just like they come together in verse 11, they also come together in verse 12. You see, Jesus' works are designed to help us believe where we have doubt. Believe on account of the works. If Jesus did it then, he'll do it again. If my verbal testimony is leaving doubt in your mind about who I am, Jesus is saying, then look at what I have done. Let the works join with my words, and then let that lead you into faith. Jesus says, truly, without a doubt, truly, he says it twice, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Here's the question. Do you want to do the work? Do you want to do the work? What specific works does Jesus have in mind? What helps us to believe in him? How is your faith growing? Whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. The works that point people to faith. The works that deepen your faith. Your works, your life is a display of the trustworthiness of Jesus. Hmm. So everything that we need, we can ask for and receive. Whatever you ask for in my name, this is what I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Mark Batterson, when we were doing the Bible study in all the circle, made it clear that we get not because we ask not. We get not because we ask not. Jesus is saying no condition can cause you to not abide in him and his words. Because whatever you ask, it will be done for you. John 5, 14 and 15 says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have requested, we have asked of him of Jesus. 
And Mark 11.24 says, Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. There's only one condition. You must ask in my name. So does Jesus mean we can ignore all those other conditions, like abiding in him and asking according to his will or believe in his word? Jesus said, I give you the Holy Spirit. I give you the power of the crucified and risen Christ. And now I promise that you can ask for anything in my name for this mission, for the glory of the Father. In my name. Not for your fame, but because of his divine worth and infinite payment on the cross. And according to Christ's sovereign wisdom, Put every request through that filter for Jesus' fame, his worth, his purchase, his wisdom. And guess what? Everything that you need to do his works will be done. And even greater works. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebuilt against your love, and we have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. If you would, just turn to a person close to you and please offer them the peace of Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts and lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the heights. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the heights. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, his death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery, to sin, and death, and made with us a new covenant by the washer and the spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your 
your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat and be better. This is the blood of Christ, shed for you. Once we were not a people, now we go as God's people. Once our souls were parched from the thirst, but now we go satisfied, fed by God's spiritual milk. Once our hearts were troubled, now they rest secure. Go in the peace of God. Amen.